Good morning and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the director of the Center on Global Energy Policy, professor of practice at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. Really delighted <clears throat> for today's uh, Climate Week event and to have all of you with us. Today's discussion is gonna be focused on Energizing America, a roadmap to federal investment in clean energy that we recently released here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And I'm really immensely proud of this report as I think it represents the best of what we aspire to do in our mission here at the center. Academic research that produces actionable and evidence-based solutions for policymakers to our most urgent energy and climate challenges. We know innovation is key to combating climate change. Uh, we know that we're gonna need a broad set of technologies to decarbonize hard to abate sectors like heavy industry, heavy duty transport, aviation, shipping. We've seen tremendous cost declines in renewable energy and battery storage. That has brightened the prospect for deep decarbonization that we are going to need, but we're gonna need even more. And according to the International Energy Agency, just recently in their new Energy Technology Perspectives Report, half of the cumulative emission reductions needed to achieve net zero by 2050 come from technologies not commercially available today. We also know there's a very strong case for government investment in R&D because of well-known market failures that lead the private sector to underinvest relative to the social returns of those sorts of government investments. And so when you put all of that together roughly a year ago, uh, it occurred to me that we might have an opportunity to go big on clean energy R&D but that policymakers would need a roadmap to do that. They would need good evidence-based research to know how to achieve that. It's easy to spend a lot of government money. It's a lot harder to spend it really well. So the question was, what does evidence and experience tell us about how we should spend government investments in innovation and where to put those dollars? And I was really thrilled that we could recruit Dr. Varun Sivaran to our team. Uh, followed by my repeated phone calls uh, to him to come join us and that he could come and work on this project with David Sandalo, our inaugural fellow, Dr. Julio Friedman, who's built a remarkable carbon management program for us at the center in collaboration with Con Colin Cunliffe and David Hart at ITIF. I really wanna thank them for their tremendous work on this important project, producing such a valuable uh, and, and useful report for our policy community. Uh, I also want to thank the extraordinarily distinguished energy leaders who are helping us release this report today. They'll get a proper introduction in a moment, but, but uh, they are such a distinguished list. I just want to thank them for being with us. My friend, Dr. Liz Sherwood Randall, who served with such distinction as the Deputy Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration, and also consistent with the mission of the Energy Center, brings together expertise and research uh, on the myriad dimensions of energy from climate change to nuclear nonproliferation to geopolitics and cybersecurity uh, better than anyone I know. Uh, Representative Kathy Castor, chair of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which produced an extraordinarily valuable blueprint for how to combat climate change you will hear about. Laura John Brown, known for many things, including taking BP beyond petroleum uh, with a speech at Stanford more than two decades ago and whose recent book, Listen to it if you haven't had a chance to read it on the podcast I did with him. Make, Think, Imagine explains the role of technology and engineering in solving global challenges like climate change. Also a member of the advisory board at the Center on Global Energy Policy. A huge thank you to all of you for being here. Congrats again to Varun and David and Julio and Colin and, and, uh, and David on this tremendous report. Uh, really appreciate all the hard work on this. Very proud of it as a product of the Center on Global Energy Policy and let me turn the agenda now to someone who's uh, been my partner every step of the way since almost day one, building the Center on Global Energy Policy, David Sandalo. You're on mute, David. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your leadership of the Center. Thank you for your inspiration for this report. Um, as Jason said, we're here today to talk about clean energy innovation um, and our Energizing America report, which proposes that the US federal government launch a national energy innovation mission. Uh, and we have a tremendous lineup for doing that. Jason just uh, summarized it, but here's, here's our plan for, for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. We're gonna be begin our discussions with remarks by uh, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, former Deputy Secretary of Energy, currently a distinguished professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. Then we're going to move to a presentation by uh, uh, Colin Cunliffe and Varun Sivaram on our Energizing America report. 
Then we're going to turn to Lord John Brown, the former CEO of BP and Representative Kathy Castor, chair of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. We'll have a, uh, a virtual fireside chat on these issues. Um, and then we'll answer uh, questions. Um, and, and if you have questions, um, you can submit them in two ways. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom, you can submit a question um, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen by using that. Um, and for those of you watching on live stream, you can submit a question via Twitter using our hashtag CJEP Live uh, or a Twitter handle uh, at Columbia U Energy. Um, so to kick it off, I'm really thrilled and honored to be able to introduce um, Dr. Liz Sherwood Randall. Um, in addition to the positions that we've already mentioned, her service as Deputy Secretary of Energy. Um, she has served as the White House Coordinator for Defense Policy, countering uh, we uh, weapons of mass destruction and arms control, as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European Affairs on the White House National Security Council, and as a Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Department of Defense. She has a long and distinguished record in government and, uh, and in academia. Um, uh, Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you, Jason, and my many colleagues and good friends at Columbia Center on Energy Policy, on Global Energy Policy, for inviting me to join you during New York Climate Week for the launch of your important new report, Energizing America. I salute you for taking the initiative to build a terrific team and to offer this clear and actionable proposal to meet the challenge of climate change through a tripling of federal investment in, in innovation and a White House-led government-wide government effort to maximize its impact. Energizing America opens with the somber reality. Unchecked climate change endangers our security, economy, and well-being. Indeed, I'm zooming in today from my California home, where the most extreme fires in our state's history have burned over 3 million acres, and we are living with darkened skies and rolling blackouts. As the New York Times warned ominously, don't think of it as the warmest month of August in California in the last century. Think of it as one of the coolest months of August in California in the next century. Mm. I'd like to start by offering some positive principles that can guide our thinking about the nationwide campaign that we need to launch and lead to meet this moment. You'll immediately recognize that they are fully synergistic with the spirit and substance of energizing America. First, everything we do must be science-based. Second, we need to develop all the tools that can contribute to radically reducing carbon emissions so that we can meet our net zero emissions goals by mid-century. We should not pick technology favorites. Instead, we should generate optionality because the needs of different cities, states, regions, and countries will be varied and we will need a wide array of possibilities to meet those needs. Third, building on that rapid deployment point, we need to move fast. Fourth, we need to deliberately integrate energy security into everything that we do for ourselves and for our allies and partners. This means many things from securing reliable access to critical clean energy sources and materials to securing our energy infrastructure against pernicious threats. And fifth, we also need to deliberately integrate social equity, inclusive opportunity, and climate justice into everything we do. And in particular, we must focus on what we can do to cushion the impacts of climate change and the clean energy transition on those who will be most directly affected. So based on these principles, I'll offer what I see as the key pillars of a national strategy to deal with our intertwined energy, climate, and security challenges. I'll highlight four major lines of effort, improving energy efficiency, investing in innovation that grows jobs and enables a low carbon future, modernizing our power grid for the full spectrum of challenges it must meet, and strengthening our domestic and international partnerships. In some ways, energy efficiency represents the easiest thing we can do on the path to decarbonization. We should immediately reinstate the standards established in the Obama administration for vehicle fuel economy, light bulbs, and other consumer goods that were canceled by the current administration. 
Those requirements were changing our energy profile at home and ensuring that our companies could compete effectively in the international markets that increasingly demand more efficient products. Looking ahead, there are a number of especially promising avenues for improving energy efficiency and reducing emissions. These include increasing vehicle fuel efficiency even further, deploying demand response mechanisms in the electricity, transportation, and building sectors, promoting more efficient end use technologies, and utilizing smart systems and other new technologies to reduce energy consumption. And this brings me to a crucial point. Investments in clean energy innovation support economic opportunity and strengthen the global competitiveness of our goods and services. Deployment of new energy technologies has driven job growth in the US energy sector over the last decade at a pace that is double the national average. Overall, there's huge potential for good clean energy jobs in this country, many of which will not require a college degree. Instead, they can be accessed through training provided by partnerships between employers and community colleges, supported where necessary by federal funding. To generate these jobs, we need to launch a full-scale assault on reaching the deeply decarbonized economy by mid-century. As Energizing America points out, 40 out of the 46 critical technologies needed to realize the clean energy transition aren't on track today to meet our goals. And we must invest in the cross-cutting platforms that support this innovation and that also sharpen our military edge, such as advanced computing capabilities. When I was the deputy secretary at DOE, it was exhilarating to visit our 17 national laboratories, which are jewels in the crown of the American innovation ecosystem, and to experience firsthand the magic that they make possible. Federal investment in our labs has the power to germinate and launch new solutions across multiple interconnected energy, climate, and security challenges. And as I said at the outset, the pace of our work really matters. Therefore, a stark reality, even in a COVID-constrained fiscal environment, is that we absolutely must ramp up federal funding for clean energy innovation. Strategically invested, as proposed by Energize America, this infusion will be an engine of our economy and will position us to lead the world again. Included in this broad campaign must be accelerated work to upgrade our aging electricity grid. As California vividly shows, stresses on the grid are becoming increasingly unmanageable. They are devastating people's lives and diminishing economic productivity. To do this, we have got to modernize our infrastructure. This involves expanding our investments in battery storage so grids can meet peak demand loads and fully deploying a smart metering network that can improve transmission efficiency and distribution management. Second, we need to face the reality that the segmented grid that we have inherited is not the grid that we need. Scientists in the DOE lab system have determined that the establishment of an integrated national grid could enable us to manage the sort of heat wave induced blackouts we just endured on the West Coast. Not only would a super grid promote renewables and increase grid reliability, it could also lower prices for consumers. Unfortunately, this research has not been brought forward for action in the last few years, and that is to our detriment. Its conclusions should be recognized and a long-term implementation plan should be developed. However, we know firsthand that a more integrated grid can also introduce additional security threats. It's imperative that as we modernize our grid with new technologies, we also engineer in the solutions that will harden it and make it more resistant and resilient. But no system is foolproof, so we also need to continuously plan, prepare, and exercise to manage a wide range of threat scenarios from natural disasters and physical attacks to cyber attacks on the grid. And a coordinated response is essential, so we have to ensure increased cooperation at all levels of government and with the private sector. This call for cooperation leads me to underscore the importance of building and sustaining partnerships in all that we do. We cannot generate accelerated sustainable change in our massive energy system without doing the hard work of building broad coalitions. Very early in my career, when I was a young advisor to then Senator Joe Biden, 
he showed me that we have to search for common ground, even with colleagues and countries who strongly disagree with us, and that we should focus less on what divides us and more on what unites us. There is no way we can meet our climate goals unless we build broad coalitions. We must persuade skeptics that the effects of climate change do not discriminate by political persuasion. And we need to work across the political chasms that have widened in this country to build a clean energy future and one that holds great potential benefit for all Americans. More broadly, like a spreading pandemic, climate change knows no international borders. So we have a major stake in choices made by other countries. Geostrategically, we need to renew our support for allies and partners in securing their energy supplies, particularly from sources that enhance their sovereignty, security, and clean energy transitions. And technologically, we need to bring our innovation power to the table, which is a unique American asset. After leading the world to embrace an ambitious climate agenda, we abandoned our leadership role in 2017. Others, and in particular China, have stepped in to fill the void we left. Indeed, just yesterday, President Xi announced the goal of achieving a net zero economy by 2060. In 2017, under the auspices of its Belt and Road Initiative, China's two largest policy banks provided as much energy financing to other countries as all the multilateral development banks combined. Most of that went towards coal or other fossil fuel projects. It's worth noting that China and countries receiving this financing make up almost half of global CO2 emissions. As Energizing America highlights, American innovation has the capacity to advance solutions that meet accelerating climate challenges, evolving energy needs, and rising security threats. Our energy technology toolkit will be especially important to the developing world, where the choice is made for hundreds of millions of people who do not yet have access to electricity will have profound consequences for the whole planet. Obviously, we have some serious work to do. Our credibility has been badly damaged by the science denial of this administration, as well as by our abrupt withdrawal from the Paris Agreement and the cessation of all government to government climate collaboration. Getting our own house in order will be the necessary precondition to restoring trust in us as a reliable partner and rebuilding confidence in our global leadership. Taking a series of bold actions on day one of a new administration to launch an ambitious national clean energy and climate policy along the lines of what is proposed in Energizing America would signal our commitment to doing our part, curbing our emissions and investing our resources in clean energy solutions for ourselves and for the world. The climate crisis and its interwoven security implications present a challenge unlike anything we have faced as a planet. Early in my career, I worked on reducing the risks of nuclear proliferation that resulted from the collapsing Soviet empire. There was no roadmap, there was no precedent for dealing with the rising threat of loose nukes. But through visionary leadership, American ingenuity, and strong partnerships, we were able to achieve game-changing results. Bill Perry, the Secretary of Defense, who I served at the time, always reminded us, the hardest problems are the ones that are the most worth working on. The same is true today as we face climate change. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to lift up your terrific work and congratulations again on the launch of Energizing America. This moment calls upon each of us to use what we learned from the report to inform decisive actions in the crucial months and years ahead. The future of our planet depends on us. Thank you. Liz, thank you. Those were remarkably interesting and thoughtful remarks you just delivered. They, I think they stand alone as an important statement uh, on this topic, and I hope you'll consider distributing them. I thought, I'm really uh, Thank you. very struck by, by how comprehensive and thoughtful they were. Um, I want to just pull on a couple of threads in, in your comments. First is you mentioned you've, you've worked at the Department of the Defense. One of the recommendations that we make in Energizing America is that clean energy innovation needs to be a whole of government effort, it, not just at the US Department of Energy. And, and I think DOD might be the next agency many people look to as a place where clean energy innovation could take hold. Um, do you have any thoughts on the role of DOD in this agenda? 
Absolutely, and thank you for the question. So first of all, we all know DOD is a very operational agency. It has to anticipate, prepare for, prevent, and mitigate threats. And so it has placed a lot of focus on the risks of climate change because it perceives correctly that climate change is an accelerator of conflict. It increases the demand for the Pentagon's humanitarian response capabilities around the world. And it has huge impacts on our installations and on our war fighters. So there are immense opportunities to work on this agenda with the Department of Defense and to leverage its mission in pursuit of security, clean energy, and climate goals. And indeed, when I was the Deputy Secretary at DOE, I led an effort to do just that with the Department of Defense. We had four goals. One was to secure safe and reliable energy access for warfighters. The second was to increase efficiency of energy usage across the force because the DOD is the largest consumer of energy in the federal enterprise. The third was to enhance the resilience of our bases and our sites domestically and globally. And the fourth, and most interestingly for the innovation agenda that you have set forth in Energizing America, is for DOD to serve as a laboratory of experimentation and an early deployer of new technologies to test and prove their value. So there's lots of opportunity that needs to be harnessed by American leadership uh, to take advantage of the power and the capability of the Department of Defense in advancing our climate goals. Another question, you mentioned that you've you worked for Joe Biden many years ago, and I know you've also worked with Republican leaders uh, for decades um, in Washington. I, I wonder, based on that experience, if you have any reflections about how they think about these these sets of issues. And in, in asking that question, I just want to highlight that the Center on Global Energy Policy, we're a nonpartisan organization, um, don't take, you know, we don't support political candidates, but we'd be remiss given your extraordinary experience with these leaders in Washington, not to ask about how you think they think about these issues. Well, as I noted in, in my remarks, it's going to be tremendously important that we find common ground to stand on in this fight. I'll start with my experience of, of Vice President Biden and previous to that, Senator Biden, who has a very long track record of leadership in all of the relevant categories that will be necessary for putting together the kind of comprehensive approach that you recommend. He has experience in energy security, experience in climate policy, has a long track record on jobs and growth, and of course, in, in leading international cooperation with many countries and with many international organizations. My own experience in the most recent administration with him was observing how he led the cancer moonshot effort in the last years of his uh, um, position as vice president. And there what he did at, at President Obama's request was to build a national effort that pulled together all the actors and potential contributors who could enable us to rapidly accelerate therapeutics for treating cancer and now other, other uh, diseases and viruses like COVID-19. He put together the funding pursued the technological innovation, the partnerships with the private sector and great universities that are necessary to make a whole of nation attack on a big problem. So I would say my judgment is that he knows how to make government work for the American people and for the challenges that, place the planet, that face the planet. To the second dimension of your question, he also knows how to build the bipartisan support that's necessary to meet an exigent challenge like this one. And with respect to the Republicans who I had the privilege of working with when I was in government and have continued to work with outside of government, we saw great support for advancing our technology's frontier and supporting clean energy innovation. Most notable recently is that congressional Republicans have actually not only resisted Trump's proposals to wipe out the budget for the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, ARPA-E, but actually have increased its funding over the last few years because they know well what benefits that innovation brings to their constituents in the form of new technologies that generate new companies that create jobs and growth in the American economy and also support the transition to the clean energy future. So despite the bitter partisanship right now, I actually think it does appear plausible that with careful work, there will be more of that common ground to stand on that I spoke about earlier. That's encouraging. So, so one more question. Um, you, you've also been a leader on diversity and, and equity issues and those of um, 
fortunately gotten more prominence in the past six months than in, in years past. Um, any reflections on how the diversity and kind of, um, equity and inclusion agenda um, can work in harmony with the clean energy innovation agenda? Yes, for sure. I mean, the energy sector has not traditionally been a very diverse sector and much work needs to be done on that front. I think what we know looking ahead is there will be both opportunity and disruption in the clean energy transition. And the push that is recommended in Energizing America, there is a, the potential for generation of many new jobs. The data on clean energy uh, economy and job creation is quite interesting and I would encourage people who are interested to delve further into this to look at the 2020 U.S. Energy and Employment Report uh, for detailed information about how this sector is powering our economy. However, we know that opportunities will not be equally spread and that some regions will experience more disruption than others. And so we need to take a systems view and include considerations of potential transition impacts on specific communities in building our approach. This should not be an afterthought. It should be the a part of the main thrust of our work. And a good example right now is the reality of job loss in the oil and gas country in the United States, particularly in the Southwest, which has been accelerated by the collapse of demand for oil and gas due to COVID. In a big new push like the one described in Energizing America, there will need to be a deliberate plan for supporting workforce transition, linking existing skill sets with promising technology developments. Thank you. Thank, thank you again for your incredibly thoughtful remarks today, for your leadership on these issues you know, over, over many years. Um, and, uh, and, and now we're gonna turn to a presentation on the Energizing America report. And, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce my, my partners and co-authors here, um, starting with uh, Dr. Varun Sivaram, um, who is a senior fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Um, Varun is, he's a physicist, he's an author, he's a clean energy technology expert. Um, he's served recently as chief technology officer at Renew Power, the largest um, renewable energy developer um, in India. He served in, uh, in state government and city government. Um, uh, and as lead author of this report has done just a remarkable job. And I wanna thank you for, for all your hard work and leadership in pulling this report together, Varun. Um, I'm also thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Colin Cunliffe, who's a senior policy analyst with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation uh, in DC, works on clean energy innovation, previously worked at the US Department of Energy, um, and has, has served on the Hill as well. He's, he's also a physicist, so you're hearing presentation from from two physicists today. Um, and uh, Varun, I think you're controlling the sl slides. So if you could, well, let me, let me just start by noting uh, how delighted we were to have um, Secretary Kerry um, call our, our report, a plan to make the United States the world leader in clean energy innovation and rise, and rise to an existential challenge, creating exciting new jobs along the way. And then uh, next slide, please. So, Back in the 2007, 2008 period, there were a couple of reports that were very um, influential and widely read on this topic. One of them on the left there, it's called Rising Above the Gathering Storm. It's done by the National Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Engineering. It really was foundational for RPE um, and a number of other recommendations um, that made their way into uh, into government policy. And then there was a very um, important report put out by Center for American Progress by uh, Pete Ogden, uh, John Podesta, and John Deutsch. Um, and I, I had the privilege of serving on the Obama transition team. I went into a nondescript office building in Northwest Washington two days after the election in 2008 to, to work with a small team on initial plans for energy and environment policy for the Obama administration. And, and, and and these books were on our shelves. Um, and, and then in the early um, months of the Obama administration, where I was privileged to serve, these books were very much, um, were incredibly helpful um, uh, in, in the thinking uh, along the way about the policies we propose and implement. Um, uh, and, and what our, our aspiration for Energizing America is to provide guidance and help to Washington policymakers and broad community around the nation uh, in much the same way. Next slide. You know, 
one really important point here, which, which Liz Sherwood Randall has already made, is that this is very much a, a bipartisan uh, agenda. Um, uh, we, hope that, we hope that this can be helpful and will be helpful to decision makers on both sides of the aisle. As uh, Liz already noted, DOE, DOE energy budgets actually increased over the course of the, of the past several years, despite proposals for, for cuts. And that's, that's because of the widespread support for, from leaders like uh, you know, uh, Chairman Murkowski, who's pictured here, along with Senator Manchin. Senator Lamar Alexander has been a leader on these issues as well. Um, so uh, we, we hope that this report will be influential for people on both parties. And it's, it's really written in that way. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Varun. Great. Thanks so much, David. And I am so excited to, to do the global launch today of Energizing America. And we've been so lucky, David, to have uh, you as a co-author with your deep experience across transitions and senior levels of the administration. And I also want to, tack, uh, I also want to uh, thank Dr. Sherwood Randall for your amazing remarks to kick us off and give us a broad overview of all the benefits of energy innovation across national security, energy security, economic competitiveness, and climate change. About a year ago, as Jason Bordoff mentioned, he recognized this gap, that there is an overall vision that needs to be set, as well as a set of granular details, if we're going to really go big on energy innovation. And without that overall roadmap, uh, we very well could have political momentum dissipate, even though we have this amazing bipartisan push for energy innovation. And so ahead of the election, uh, as soon as I moved back from India, as the pandemic hit in, uh, in March, um, we, we got our great co-author crew together and we've sprinted for about six months to put together what has now become a book length publication. And here is, here is the full volume. You can pick it up on Amazon or you can download it for free uh, on the link that you should have just gotten in your Zoom chat. And so that was the goal. This, th this volume aimed to fill this gap of a high level roadmap and granular details for how we ramp up energy innovation funding. Now, Energizing America has two parts to it. The first part of the volume talks about why it is the case that we should be investing in energy innovation. And we have a storied history in the United States of national innovation missions that have delivered life-saving drugs. They've spawned Silicon Valley and the internet, among other revolutions, and they've put a man on the moon. Now it's time to elevate clean energy to the same order of magnitude as some of these other missions, health, defense, for example. And there are two critical reasons that I'll mention here on this slide, confronting climate change and boosting US competitiveness. But Dr. Sherwood Randall also told us several other reasons why energy innovation is so important. Um, and that's why we came up with this target of $25 billion by 2025. Now the target again is not enough. We need a ramp, a roadmap to get there. And as you'll see, we'll talk you through how we achieve this ramp to $25 billion across agencies, across topics, et cetera. That comes in part two. Part two of the volume is how do we actually achieve this? It's a roadmap for a national energy innovation mission. And don't try and don't worry about reading uh, the, the small print on this slide. We'll walk you through each detail, but overall, there are three components to the National Energy Innovation Mission. The first component on the left is that we think we should organize the innovation mission around 10 technology pillars. These 10 address critical decarbonization needs, and unfortunately, some of them are just underfunded today. Now, we give dozens of detailed granular initiatives across these 10 technology pillars, but policymakers shouldn't lose the, the forest for the trees. And so the middle column here, Six strategic principles enable policymakers, the next administration, Congress, to monitor the ramp over time, over five years, and make sure that we're hitting some major high-level targets, like diversity in topics, or research performer, or uh, federal agency. And then the third column says the 100-day plan, the action plan for hitting the ground running so we don't lose this amazing political momentum uh, and, and seize this window. The three actions include one for the, for the next administration, for the next Congress domestically, and then an international action for the US to retake international leadership, especially seeing what we've been uh, seeing this week uh, at UNGA week. So with that, I'd love to bring in my colleague, Colin Cunliffe. As you heard, uh, Colin is, is a master at uh, understanding these budgets. I can count on one hand 
the number of people who understand energy appropriations funding as well as Colin. And I'll also say that Colin is a recovering theoretical physicist, so smartest guy in the room. Let me hand it over to you, Colin. <laughs> Thanks, Varun. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. I will begin by laying out the need to elevate clean energy innovation as a national priority and make the case for increased funding. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so first, uh, innovation is essential to address climate change and accelerate decarbonization. You've heard a couple times already, the International Energy Agency finds that half of the emissions reductions needed to achieve a net zero energy system come from technologies that aren't yet on the market. And 40 out of 46 critical energy technologies and sectors are simply not on track to limit warming to two degrees of Celsius. But uh, the United States can drive global decarbonization by developing cheaper and better clean energy technologies. So this figure shows US energy carbon emissions under three different technology scenarios. Under a baseline scenario in blue, emissions are roughly flat at today's levels. If the Department of Energy at current funding levels are to meet its targets for clean energy technologies, then emissions could decline by 23% by 2040. And if Congress were to double the Department of Energy's research, development, and demonstration budget, then U.S. could see emissions fall an additional 15%. So it's clear that RD&D is an important part of the decarbonization toolkit. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Now, greater investment in innovation can also improve the competitiveness of U.S. energy companies and build U.S. leadership in these nascent industries. So this figure on the right shows government funding for energy research development and demonstration as a share of GDP. The U.S. government invests about 0.04% of GDP in energy RD&D. That's behind 13 other countries, and China invests twice as much. Uh, but other countries are investing heavily in these new industries. Globally, the energy industry is a $2 trillion industry, and the share of that devoted to clean energy is increasing. Last year in 2019, investment in renewable energy was $300 billion. Investment in hydrogen and electric vehicles is also growing. So there's a lot of opportunity here. And the United States still has one of the best innovation systems in the world and is well positioned to lead in a range of these nascent industries in digital energy systems, carbon capture, and advanced nuclear. Uh, you can go to the next slide. You know, private investment is also essential, but the private sector can't make the needed investment on its own. So on the left, you see early stage investments in clean tech companies. It's been growing in the last three years and it surpassed 1.5 billion in 2018. But in general, across the board, we tend to see greater levels of private investment in, in healthcare and information technologies and other innovative industries. And the reason is that new energy technologies can take decades of development and billions of dollars of investment before achieving commercial success. And private sector, private investors are simply unable to shoulder that level of risk. So on the right, if you look at corporate investment in clean energy RD&D, it's a lot lower than other industries. Major energy firms invest just 0.5% of revenue on RD&D, far less than pharmaceuticals and computers and aerospace. Um, now, historically, we've also seen that public energy RD&D can actually stimulate additional private sector investment. So in other words, every additional dollar that the federal government invests encourages private sector investment. And that's part of the reason why many private sector leaders are pressing the government for uh, more support for innovation. Next slide. So we're recommending $25 billion by 2025, and this is not unprecedented. Federal investment put a man on the moon, launched the civilian nuclear energy industry, and we currently invest far more in health and defense research. So these historical examples and, and current examples show that we can marshal the innovative capacity of the United States on the scale that we are recommending. $25 billion by 2025 translates to roughly 0.1% of GDP on energy R&D, &D, which is about what we invested 40 years ago when the Department of Energy was created. Uh, so we believe that this target is, is both ambitious, but it's measured 
um, and uh, it's measured in a way that helps maximize the return on our investment in federal R D and D. So, next slide. Now, tripling the clean energy R D and D budget does not mean tripling the Department of Energy's budget. So as part of our research, we developed the first government-wide estimate of clean energy R&D since 2016. And we find that other agencies, such as the Department of Defense and NASA, National Science Foundation, and Department of Agriculture, are also investing about $1.8 billion a year on clean energy research. And we make recommendations for all of these federal agencies so that increases aren't concentrated in a single agency's budget. Next slide. So uh, part two really fleshes out the details of the roadmap. This is the bulk of Energizing America. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide again. So Varun already mentioned the three main parts. It starts with 10 key technology pillars that form the basis of the rd and portfolio. And then strategic principles for how to build an rd and portfolio around these pillars. And finally, some tactical guidance and immediate actions for the next administration and Congress to take. I'm going to start by introducing the technology pillars. Uh, now, each pillar groups technologies based on distinct applications. So, for example, nuclear power and renewable power generation are in pillar two for clean electricity generation. And then some technologies find homes in multiple pillars. So energy storage is split among the transportation and clean fuels and grid modernization pillars, three, four, and five. And then energy efficiency touches all of the pillars, but is particularly concentrated in the end use sectors. So here you see buildings highlighted, but also it's important in transportation systems and the industrial sector. And then uh, finally, there are a number of cross-cutting and underfunded pillars that focus on critical decarbonization needs but are sometimes overlooked. So the industrial sector, for example, accounts for 22% of direct greenhouse gas emissions, but only 6% of DOE's current innovation portfolio. Uh, federal carbon capture research is currently focused just on coal power generation. But carbon capture is a cross-cutting technology that can be used for industrial facilities such as cement and steel manufacturing. Uh, pillar nine, clean agricultural systems. The agricultural sector is particularly challenging to decarbonize and there are few good options right now. And then finally, carbon dioxide removal uh, can help offset residual emissions from hard to decarbonize sectors. So these pillars here are the most underfunded and I'd just like to emphasize this approach by focusing on the decarboniza decarbonization needs rather than on uh, a technology-based approach. This helps us keep our, our eyes on the prize and really focus on decarbonization. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Varun to go over the strategic principles. Great, thanks Colin. Um, so look, if, if you read chapter five of Energizing America, you'll get through all these 10 technology pillars and it's a dense list of dozens of different initiatives and you add up the cost of all these initiatives and, and you'll get to the target we're supporting, which is a ramp toward $25 billion by 2025. But that's kind of the bottom up lens. And we also wanted to give policymakers a top down lens that also explains how do you get to $25 billion without losing the forest for the trees. And that's why we have these six strategic pillars. I'm thrilled by the way that the animations are working. So we, we spent all night getting these to, to, to work out. Now, the six strategic pillars, um, no, six strategic principles relate to different elements of diversity. When I say diversity, I'm talking about making sure that the National Energy Innovation Mission harnesses all of the different diverse resources in the country and attacks all of the diverse elements of the problem. So we're talking about diversity of topics, diversity of stages of the innovation pipeline, diversity of federal agencies, diversity of folks who can do research, national labs, the private sector, universities, diversity across the country. Uh, and the final principle brings it all together and explains how we've not only got to be predictable in our ramp, but we have to be flexible and adaptable. So let me walk through each of these principles. The first principle is to match the funding portfolio to critical decarbonization needs. Look, today, we don't do a very good job of that. 
and this is true around the world, the IEA reports that countries fail to match their research development and demonstration investments with what's really needed for deep decarbonization and solving climate change. Here on the right, you see uh, U.S. emissions, you know, let's say 22% or 27% are coming from electricity, but fully half of our research development and demonstration expenditures go into electricity technologies. We're misallocating our funding when it comes to areas such as uh, agriculture, um, buildings, uh, et cetera. And that's why when we talk about our 10 technology pillars, we want that as a lens for policymakers to use to immediately identify which ones are underfunded. As we'll show you in a later slide, some of the later pillars, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, uh, industrial decarbonization, clean agricultural systems, carbon dioxide removal, they're all grossly underfunded. And we make it a point to increase funding for those pillars first. The, the second thing um, that the, the federal government should keep in mind as it ramps up funding is to support all stages of the innovation pipeline. Look, basic scientific research is widely popular, but it is not enough. In addition to basic scientific research, the federal government will need to invest across stages of technology development. Here's a graphic from 2016. You can see how the federal government dominates early stage research, but the private sector has to step in for later stage demonstration, uh, later stage development. Now this is 2016, the picture's gotten even worse since. We basically don't fund demonstrations anymore, um, with a small exception for nuclear energy demonstrations. The federal government needs to come in and muscularly support development and demonstration because without them technologies can wither on the vine or i'm going to use another metaphor uh, fail in the valley of death there are multiple valleys of death where private investment is not sufficient to bring technologies to commercialization the third principle is to marshal the full capacity of the federal government look today the department of energy accounts for 80 percent of clean energy innovation funding by 2025, we want to see that proportion drop to 50%. Not because the Department of Energy doesn't do a great job. Let's be clear, we're doubling the Department of Energy's budget. Or rather, we're calling on the President and Congress to do that. But in addition, there are so many other resources in the federal government that can do a great job and whose missions are aligned with clean energy innovation. I'm talking about, as Dr. Sherwood Randall mentioned, the Department of Defense, which may benefit from advanced microgrids or lighter and cheaper uh, and, and more effective batteries and solar panels for forward deployments. I'm talking about NASA, which by the way, developed fuel cells that we now use back on earth. I'm talking about the National Science Foundation, the US Department of Agriculture for that clean agricultural systems pillar. By 2025, we wanna see the $25 billion target met by over a dozen agencies using the complementary approaches of the federal government. For example, the Department of Defense is very good at leveraging later stage private sector support for demonstration, testing, and evaluation. And that complements the Department of Energy's focus on earlier stage research and its focus not on the private sector, but on national laboratories, which are the crown jewels of the US research ecosystem. That brings me to the next principle, which is we want to use not just the national laboratories, which dominate today's energy innovation funding, but also get resources and investment toward the private sector and to universities. Look, in the case of the Health Innovation Mission, from 2010 to 2016, NIH funding underpinned every single one of the 210 life-saving drugs that the FDA approved. That's an incredible example of how the federal government can partner with universities to achieve commercializable, end-use-inspired research. And in addition, there's a body, a wealth of uh, research showing that the private sector, private firms, do very well when the government intelligently invests in private innovation. For example, SBIR grants have led to companies being more successful across rates of patenting, publication, and further revenue. ARPA-E has proven its success in terms of rates of patenting. So the United States, when it launches this national energy innovation mission, shouldn't pursue a monoculture of just funding one kind of research. It should fund a range of research across a range of entities. The, the next principle is to partner with state and local governments across the country this figure from the Energy Futures Initiative, and let me give my thanks to Secretary Moniz and his amazing organization for all the research they've done. The Energy Futures Initiative has chronicled or cataloged all of the clean energy investment activity happening around the country. These are innovation clusters, and we should be fostering diverse clusters in communities all over the country. It's, it's important for inclusive economic growth, as Dr. Sherwood Randall mentioned, 
And it's also important for just harnessing the different comparative advantages of the United States. And to do so, the federal government needs to partner with states. Today, only a couple states, California and New York, have the resources available to really invest in energy innovation. All 50 states should be doing this. And finally, I'll mention that we need to be predictable. Energy innovation has stalled in the past when funding was unpredictable, when funding was cut, for example, in the 80s. And that's why we've laid out this roadmap. And Chair Castor, who's gonna to talk to us in a moment, has laid out a potential target of $35 billion by 2030 in the House Select Committee report. And I think that's fantastic. We need long-term predictability for research to happen apace and for technologies to really come to market. But we also need to be smart and adapt the individual priorities to what's working. That's why the federal government needs to develop the capability to really monitor the innovation outcomes from the investments it makes to protect taxpayer dollars. All right, I've got three minutes to walk you through the three immediate actions because a five-year roadmap is all well and good, but we'll lose that political moment unless we have immediate actions to hit the ground running with for the next administration and Congress. There's a reason we put this out right before the election. So let me talk through them. Number one, the first immediate action is for the president to launch the National Energy Innovation Mission. This is an example of a presidential policy directive that the president should write in the first 100 days of office, launching the mission, committing to a funding target of $25 billion by 2025, and creating a White House task force that will convene agencies from across the federal government, remember over a dozen have to contribute, and speeding implementation and coordination. Now, the president will also need to submit a budget very early for FY22, and that's where Congress comes in. We urge Congress to pass a budget for FY22 that immediately puts us on the path to $25 billion. And we've done some of the hard work to get us there. Um, what I'm showing you here is increases in funding across each of the 10 technology pillars. As you'll notice, the most underfunded pillars today, like carbon dioxide removal, get the highest proportional funding increase in FY22. Energizing America has a funding roadmap for FY22 all the way to FY26, and all of that is in, is in the massive appendix. Um, and thanks a lot to Colin for, for preparing it. And then finally, on the international stage, it's important for the US to reassert its leadership. Look, this week, China shocked the world with an amazing net zero target. Now, who knows if you know, there's any fine print to it, but the United States needs to get back on the international stage. Paris is a great first step. Mission innovation is another wonderful step. Today, the Mission Innovation Ministerial the countries that have committed to double their funding for research development and demonstration is meeting. The U.S. should reassert its leadership. This was an Obama administration spearheaded initiative, and the U.S. should lead international collaboration on energy innovation, getting us back in the game. I'll close just by saying we are really gratified at the tremendous reception we've gotten for Energizing America. You know, uh, I, I urge you to check out some of these articles, the Vox article, for example, because they really hone in on something so critical, which is we wrote Energizing America to nail a policy that could feasibly be implemented on day one of the next administration and Congress. I'll go even further. I'll say this is the number one most important thing that the United States can do to speed global clean energy transitions and fight climate change. To be clear, we want to pair energy innovation with a robust suite of climate policies. It may cost trillions of dollars. But this $25 billion, this is an amazing way to start and the most impactful centerpiece. So with that, let me hand it back over to David Sandelow. We hope you download or buy a copy. We're thrilled to have you with us today in the audience. Thanks, guys. Arun, th thank you so much. Thanks for your amazing work on this report. Colin, thank you as well. I want to highlight as well the absolutely central contributions to this report from our co-authors, Julio Friedman and, and David Hart. Um, Varun, before you go away, I had a quick question for you. Um, for, for those people who are listening, um, do you um, do you kind of have a 10 second summary of this? If somebody is uh, walking down the street or an elevator and just wants to deliver the core message of energizing America to somebody, what's that 10 second message? I don't know if I'll get 10 seconds, but let me try. The US should urgently launch a national energy innovation mission, triple its investment in clean energy research development and demonstration, to counter climate change and prosper from global clean energy transitions. That's the takeaway. Perfect, perfect. All right, well, we, we could not be more thrilled um, to, to welcome 
two global leaders uh, on these issues. Um, Lord John Brown is, is, I think, one of the best known energy executives in the world, dating back to his 12 years as CEO of, of BP. He, he's a former president of the UK Royal Academy of Engineering, former partner at Riverstone, where he is co-head of the world's largest renewable energy private equity fund. He currently serves as chairman, executive chairman of L1 Energy, and he is a member of the Center on Global Energy Policies Advisory Board. Representative Kathy Castor uh, is chair of the US House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Among her many accomplishments, she led the development of a 600 plus page report released this summer that may be the most comprehensive legislative package on climate change ever developed. Um, she represents Florida's 14th congressional district, which includes Tampa Bay. Her work on energy issues includes championing measures on energy efficiency, offshore drilling, environmental justice, and more. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome both of you and uh, Lawyer John Brown, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. It's a great honor to be here with uh, Representative uh, Castor, who has agreed that I can call her Kathy, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, I'm particularly keen as well to say congratulations to the Center for the extraordinary report on energizing America, which I know will make a very big difference, not just in America, but globally. Now, uh, I Kathy and I are going to have a conversation, but I think the most appropriate thing to do is ask Kathy if he could, she could talk a little bit, a little bit about her work uh, on the climate crisis in the House Select Committee. So, Kathy, over to you. Well, thank you, John, and thanks to everyone at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. I am uh, thrilled to, to be here and to be discussing the Energizing America report because it comes on the heels of our Solving the Climate Crisis report that uh, we rolled out uh, here on Capitol Hill at the end of June. And uh, our reports are in sync. There is a growing consensus about how we move forward in tackling the climate crisis. Uh, I encourage you all to go in and read our report as well at uh, house.climatecrisis.gov. You will see uh, many of the same policies uh, laid out, but our action plan uh, says that we've got to reach net zero as soon as possible, no later than 2050, the science tells us. It's, uh, our report's been described as the most detailed and thought out plan that has ever been part of US politics, but it's a great report, but now it's time to enact it into law. And in the House of Representatives, we are moving significant portions of that package, trying to get the US Senate to negotiate with us. In fact, just today, uh, we'll be uh, debating a new clean energy package. Uh, but the scope and scale of what we need to do is great. And uh, we don't have much more time. Uh, so I'll look forward to, to talking about the provisions on clean energy R&D and what we need to do to energize America. Kathy, thank you. Perhaps I could start then by a, a very simple question. We've had a lot of targets in the past, mission uh, innovation, for example, set clear targets, uh, and we haven't met them. So in some ways, I have to ask you what's different this time? What can we do to make sure that these great pieces of work actually get delivered? Well, the, uh, I think the fires uh, across uh, the western part of North America, the ramped up hurricane season have caught everyone's attention, but we need sustained advocacy here at the national level. I've, I've been gratified that many states, local communities, academic institutions have been in the lead, but that's no substitute for a broad and ambitious national policy here in the United States of America. Uh, you know, we've developed many of the clean and renewable energy technologies deployed all over the world but it's time for us to reclaim our mantle of leadership, expand our leadership role, and do it expeditiously as we work to solving the climate crisis and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, but we need the private sector uh, to help with that, to help build an equitable and just clean energy economy uh, and press the federal government 
to do so, press this Congress to act in a bipartisan way so that it is uh, long lasting and actually written into law that can't be rolled back from administration to administration. So let me follow up a couple of points if I can. First, uh, uh, there's been a, a remarkable number of fires and hurricanes. We've run out of the alphabet already, uh, which is uh, a pretty uh, a remarkable thing. And I guess also that we're all deeply concerned and very sad and, and uh, mournful uh, about the impact on our health of COVID-19. Do you think all of this, when you take it in sum, might accelerate or decelerate uh, the investment thrust in uh, in the climate crisis? Yes, John, you're... you're uh thoughtful in raising COVID-19 in this global health pandemic uh, for a number of reasons. We know now there was a Harvard study uh, preliminary that said that if you uh, have COVID-19 and you come from a disparate background and environmental justice community, you're more likely to suffer serious consequences and, and a higher mortality rate. So that's one wake up call. Then there's the global competitiveness issue and the need to, as uh, Vice President Biden says, build back better. What a better uh, starting point than the clean energy economy, uh, strengthening our supply chains, uh, grabbing hold of the opportunities for the clean electric vehicles, the cars we drive, the buses our children ride to school, investments in transit, all of and all of the cutting edge technologies that historically have started in the the United States of America, but we we're falling behind a little bit. So that's why this report is so important. It, pro it does provide that roadmap uh, for when and how we need to invest to solve the climate crisis, but really to, to uh, come out of this uh, economic t catastrophe driven by a global pandemic. I think that remains a really important point in our advocacy to say that COVID-19 should not set this back, but actually rather accelerate uh, what we are doing uh, to solve the climate crisis. Can I ask you about also the private sector. Obviously the private sector is the motor in the end that makes it all work. They, they deliver. What else can we do to make the private sector take more risks in this area and spend more money uh, in R&D and innovation in, uh, in new energy technologies? Again, it's a very weak amount of money. Well, I heard loud and clear from the, the last panel, and it's written th throughout this important report uh, about what a federal investment can do in partnership with entrepreneurs and businesses uh, here. And uh, we have to do that. Yes, it's when you compare the amount of research uh, investment dollars out of the federal government in the health sector compared to the energy sector, uh, there there simply is no context. And then bring in defense. If we can replicate what we're doing in health and defense in the energy sector for R&D, helping those businesses get through the valley of death, we will be on a better pathway to solving the climate crisis. And you will see uh, innovations, uh, patents, Opportun job opportunities explode. And you know, this younger generation now, they're hungry for those opportunities. They want to be part of the solution. I, I have a great faith in this younger generation. They're going to press us uh, to make this a reality. Uh, and, and so uh, do, you think, uh, that, uh, do you think that the traditional uh, old, uh, what I think people now would call the old economy oil and gas companies have a role in this? Do you think they should be uh, in, encouraged to invest in this area or not? You bet they do. We want uh, oil and gas, fossil fuel companies, uh, we want them to become clean energy companies. And some have been 
better than others. And it, it will take federal policy, uh, the various pushes and pulls, the, you know, to, to move them in that direction. For example, in our report, uh, we establish a, we say the uh, federal government should establish a clean energy standard across the country because it's so disjointed right now. You, you have some states that have have renewable portfolio standards and others that do not. For example, I come from the so-called sunshine state, but we generate very little power from uh, the sun and solar power. And we think that can be uh, a very important tool now, a goal to help move uh, energy companies to, to become clean energy companies over time. And I think also your point about uh, successive generations wanting to be involved in this. I have a sense that uh, maybe to coin a phrase, uh, people are more keen to work in Palo Alto than they are in the Permian Basin. Uh, and so it may just be something which is really important for companies to think through. Can I? Yeah, but we, we envision these uh, clean energy jobs and opportunities uh, all across the country, especially in communities that, that need them. If you look at some of the uh, old uh, coal communities, they are looking for what is their next economic development opportunity. And we know as we energize America, we've got to construct the modern grid. We've got to build the macro grid and get the renewable resources out to homes and businesses. Uh, that's going to provide enormous opportunities for, for jobs, not just in, in construction, but technology and, and energy innovation, energy efficiency. And I think that uh, the, I think it needs to be communicated more. Uh, we need a little more hope in America today. And, and uh, uh, forgive me, I, I completely agree with you. It's uh, it, it was a coin, a turn of phrase rather than uh, a point of uh, geography. I think that I'm choosing. Can I turn to the question of incentives? Uh, I think everybody's used to talk about uh, carbon trading as a very important tool and technique. And then uh, suddenly everybody started talking about carbon taxes, uh, which was Baker Schultz report, for example. Uh, and now uh, we're back to carbon trading. What, what, what's your view? What, what, what should we think of as policy here and why? Uh, when you look at the Biden platform or you examine our solving the climate crisis report uh, or the Senate climate uh, report that has been released, uh, a carbon price is barely mentioned. And there's a reason for that. Um, it's, it's not a silver bullet. I think everyone has, has come to the conclusion and when you, businesses, they're, they're, I appreciate they're now actively calling for a price on carbon and I understand it's at the center of what the EU uh, is trying to do. So, but here in the US, uh, we, we definitely need to level the playing field, just like businesses uh, have to pay to have the garbage collected from their facilities. Polluters should have to pay for the cost of their pollution. And it's not fair that hardworking people are kind of bearing those costs right now. So, uh, and, and let's just say, especially communities of color and, and working class and low income communities, they often bear a disproportionate impact. So putting a, a price on carbon in our report, we recommend, yes, it is an important tool, uh, but everywhere there is a carbon price in the world, there are also complementary policies like renewable energy and energy efficiency targets and standards. Uh, so in the United States, state renewable requirements are should be coupled with federal tax incentives uh, to help drive clean energy deployment. Um, the debate about carbon pricing has driven climate solutions over the past uh, decade. In our report, we wanted to make clear that it will take a variety of policies to address the climate crisis. It's a comprehensive problem and it requires a comprehensive solution. Again, it's not a silver bullet. So more of a system support, uh, a systems uh, uh, approach between policy regulation uh, and uh, and uh, financial instruments of some sort. 
Yes, and it can be an important uh, revenue stream uh, for all the investments in clean energy that we would like to make. When I come back, uh, obviously we've spent, uh, everyone has spent an enormous amount of time talking about the climate crisis. First about climate change, now about climate crisis. Uh, and uh, somehow we've never quite pushed this over the line. What do you think will be different this time? We've mentioned uh, one thing, which is uh, people's local uh, senses that uh, uh, the climate is, the weather has changed, the uh, hurricanes are taking place, there are wildfires in, in and around big cities in, in, in California. What else do you think it takes? What, what, what changes uh, the real push to get this done? Yeah, a, a few things. I think the the escalating costs that families and businesses have to bear because of climate. You know, I come from the uh, state of Florida, and my neighbors are paying more for their flood insurance, for their property insurance. We have longer, hotter summers, so our air conditioning bills are out of sight with coastal flooding. And it's not just limited to coastal areas, these extreme uh, flood events, <clears throat> people are having to, to pay more on stormwater or it's flooding out the crops of farmers in the Midwest. So people understand now that there is a significant cost to inaction and we've got to turn this around. Plus, they, they've seen clean energy work. They, they understand in parts of this country or their neighbor down the street who put solar panels on their house. Boy, they've really saved a bunch of money. And that's that's a little different from uh, a lot of our energy companies in the past that have pushed pushed the message that the transition to clean energy is too is too expensive for the average person. But that does highlight the need to ensure that uh, the benefits are tangible to everyone, that they're tangible to people, especially in environmental justice communities. And, and that's where our, our report recommends that we start, that a lot of the resilience efforts, a lot of the clean energy efforts, we target them to the communities that have long carried the, the burden uh, of uh, pollution and climate impacts. Very good. Can I just uh, talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. In, in the international context? Would you expect more from agencies like the International Energy Agency, would you expect more from uh, different multinational uh, organizations to keep pushing this message across the world? Do you think they've done a good job or a bad job? No, we, everyone has a role to play here in uh, advancing our level or increasing our level of ambition because we're out of time. Uh, here in the United States, we've waited too long to take the kind of ambitious steps that we need to to reduce carbon pollution. Uh, so now in our Solving the Climate Crisis report, it's a, we have uh, probably the most extensive uh, provisions when it comes to resilience and adaptation uh, because we've waited too long. So we can't wait any longer. We need the entire international community. We need the United States of America to reclaim its leadership role. And, and I know that's top of mind for everyone here 40 some days away from the election. Uh, the Paris Climate Accord, the United States commitment to the rest of the world will go away if uh, we reelect the president and, and don't take a, a, a turn here. Uh, but, but I see all across this country, people are, are ready. They, they know that what we need to do and, and thank goodness for a report like uh, Energizing America where they do provide a roadmap. It's, it's doable, it's not, it's not pie in the sky. Uh, we just need to act. So let me ask you my, my final question. It's, uh, it's for you to say what you, what you really want, I think. But what would you see, what, what do you think when we, if we were sitting here in two years time, what would you see as uh, America's climate policy? And how would they be, uh, how would America be getting back the leadership from let's say China? Yeah, you uh, 
the, the announcement out of China, I hope, will uh, start the competitive juices flowing here across the United States of America, uh, because when we compete, we do very well. And that's what we have to do. We have to use every tool in the toolbox. Uh, a big part of it, as this report, Energizing America, lays out, is investing at a level that meets the scientific imperative to reduce carbon pollution and create the clean energy technologies going forward. So we're going to need a more robust and expert Department of Energy. Sometimes they're viewed as kind of a stepchild here in the US government that can't be any longer. We need them to be a, a force for good innovation and swift technological advancement. Uh, but we've got to do things across every sector of our economy. We've got, to, we've got to harness our tax policy in the right ways, not doubling down on dirty um, fuels of the past, but look forward. We've got to empower our farmers. We've got to protect our public spaces, our public lands and offshore waters, and rather than exploit them, turn them into places we sequester carbon and create new clean energy solutions. Uh, We've got to ensure that we do this in an equitable and just way with fair labor standards, with uh, attention to our, envi our environmental justice communities, not just attention, but make sure they are uh, at the table every step of the way. And then the transportation sector, I think, is, is very exciting because we, we can um, put a lot of folks to work, expand uh, the job opportunities especially in the Midwest part of the country with our new electric vehicles, the supply chains, and then improve the public health. I think COVID has shined a light on the fact that our public health uh, infrastructure in America is weak. Our supply chains are weak. Uh, and and it, now we're in the middle of a pandemic that's affecting the air we breathe or that the, our uh, respiratory systems and the air we breathe will be more important than ever. Those are my a few of my helps. That's uh, very encouraging, Representative Kester. Thank you very much for uh, such uh, great answers. I think I now hand it back to David. David. Thank you. Well, thank you, John Brown. Thank you, Kathy Kester, for those remarkably rich comments and and what what a great discussion. We have literally dozens of fantastic questions um, in the queue and 13 minutes to get to them. So we're not gonna be able to do all the really insightful questions that came in justice, but we, we also have some very distinguished leaders in the audience and I, I just wanna pick out a few of their questions. Um, starting with Admiral Denny McGinn, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and Admiral McGinn asks about public-private partnerships, which is a topic that, that you touched on, um, Lord Brown and Representative Castor in your dialogue, but I wanted to throw the question to you, um, John, um, on public-private partnerships and with your deep experience in this sector, um, what, what are your thoughts about how to how governments can best engage the private sector on this agenda? So uh, they're, they are, of course, very important. And the key point is, is picking them at the right time in the development of anything. Uh, early on, taking full risk from the government and then moving through different types of partnerships. I saw that in the semiconductor industry uh, from my first hand. I see it uh, all over the world. I think it really is essential uh, to get this going. Uh, and you can see it developing already. So, some things that can be made already by industry, such as uh, EVs and uh, advanced repulsion, uh, are things that are happening now and need a, a limited amount of partnership. There are other things which uh, needed a uh, partnership at the beginning and now fully fledged uh, outside. And some things, as I think the report says, things like CCS, CCU, all these complex things, big, big risks. Uh, we know how to make all the bits in this technology. As an engineer, I'd say we can engineer it, but you wouldn't want to see it if we did. It'd be very, very expensive and very clumsy. So we need to get it all sorted out and and find out, and that's a very big risk. That needs a public-private partnership of some sort. Thank you. Well, Kevin Leahy writes on a different topic. He says, uh, over the past few decades, a good part of the US innovation um, capacities have not been focused on energy. 
can anyone discuss why they believe we still have the technical capabilities needed to make big changes? Uh, Varun, I see you nodding. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and Kevin, thanks for joining. It's a terrific question. Um, well, first of all, Energizing America is a call to increase investment in order to build capabilities in energy. But beyond that, we also start from a great foundation in energy. We have the crown jewels of the energy research ecosystem, the national laboratories. We also have a bunch of adjacent industries. The United States is a leader in machine learning, for example. We're a leader in digital energy products. Um, and, and we have a, a other strengths. We have the largest number of pilot projects on carbon capture and sequestration in the US. We have the world's most valuable car company. So there are a lot of great strengths that the US can build on as the world's number one science and technology superpower. And I think if we invest this $25 billion very intelligently in the different technology pillars for energy will best leverage our competitive advantages. Liz, I know you uh, manage the national lab system. Um, any thoughts about the technical capabilities in the national labs today? <laughs> well, they're phenomenal and they have enormous surge capacity. One of the reasons we invest in our labs is not only what they do today for us, but what they will be able to do in the future when we need them to do it. And they are poised to take advantage of two things. One is renewed leadership. I mean, I noted, I tried to be diplomatic about it, but I noted that some of the work that has been done in our labs has not been brought to light by the current administration. And there's a lot more to be said on that. There are scientists just waiting to have the opportunity to bring forward the work they have been doing to the benefit of the American people and the world. And the second thing is they do need strategic funding. They need leadership that sets goals, guides them in terms of deciding which labs play the leading role and which play supporting roles, which ones should maximize their competitive advantage in one arena versus another. There are a lot of different missions as, we, as we've discussed on the technology front, which need to be advanced simultaneously. But let me add a very important point, which is the imperative of supporting a pipeline of STEM brains. So yeah. we see in our ecosystem of laboratories a big retirement wave coming at us. And we need to be investing in the young people who will power our future by contributing, whether it's in our laboratories, in our great research universities, or in our private sector, uh, to the challenges of the future. And we can't do it unless we train them to be capable of engaging the science. I mean, Varun, our brilliant young scientist part of this project, is a good example of the kind of young person we need to multiply because we need so much talent to tackle the challenges that we face on this front and many others. May I just add, I think in my experience too, it's so important to have a target out there and a consistent plan to get there because it takes time to build people, equipment, ideas, and the management processes. Uh, that's really important. You can't chop and change here. We have another question on basically on deployment versus R&D policy. And it, it's a bit of a skeptical question, actually. It says more or less you guys are emphasizing R&D and D or, you know, but it isn't the real driver of clean energy de um, innovation deployment policies. Uh, Varun or Colin, you want to comment on that? I'm going to take a really quick stab because this is super important. We have a whole box on this, box 2-1, which says there have been a range of econometric studies that try and disambiguate the effects of deployment and learning and R&D on the cost of technologies. And the surprising result is that R&D is by far the most important driver of cost reductions, both in the early stage of a technology as well as in the later stage. And so you cannot miss out on research development demonstration and just hope that ah, if we build something enough, it will get cheaper over time as we have learning and economies of scale, we get better at building it. No, 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 you absolutely have to invest in innovation. Failing to do that is going to, to, to lead us to a cul-de-sac. That's my 20 second response. I think Representative Esther made a very good set of points on this matter. Yeah, and, and um, Representative Kester, do you see kind of political um, momentum possible on, on these policies? Uh, deployment policies? Uh, I do. I think uh, there is a lot of bipartisan discussion on innovation. I would like those discussions and the dialogue to turn into actual votes and support for the, for the appropriations bills. Uh, that's where you all come in all across the country. We need business leaders to press policymakers here in Washington 
uh, no matter their party, to to invest in R and D, and that means investing in our businesses, and that means also the complementary policies that come along with training the workforce, uh, investing in our research universities, in our grad students, in the National Science Foundation to make sure that that pipeline of talent, and it goes all the way back to K through 12 uh, education to make sure that the STEM uh, uh, classrooms are, are, are filled with the best and the brightest in, in teachers and professors too. So I, I know Columbia's out there, you're ahead of the game, but this needs to permeate everything that we're doing all across the country. Yeah, and I should note that at Columbia, of course, we're deeply committed on, it's core to our mission in educating the next generation. It's core to what we do. Jason Bordoff somehow manages to teach one or two courses a semester while running the Center on Global Energy Policy. I'm not sure how he does that, but um, it, it's, it's absolutely central. And Varun, I just want to note that that was an incredibly thoughtful answer. And Jason, you can correct me, but I think that was the first time we've ever had the word disambiguate used in a, an event <laughs> of Center on Global Energy Policy, uh, and, and incredibly well as glibly as well. Um, Dan Ferger asked a really interesting question um, on reorganizing the Department of Energy and other federal agencies in order to accomplish this mission um, and whether our report recommends reorganizations. And I'm gonna start with an answer and then turn to the other authors. I'll say this was actually one topic on which we had some disagreement within our author group. Um, and I was probably at the most skeptical end. My, my experience managing federal agencies makes me very cautious on reorganizing. Um, it, it takes a lot of time and energy um, and, and, uh, and so I think it should only be done with a clear vision of what the outcomes are and what the goals are, recognizing that it's gonna take a lot of resources to reorganize. Um, but there were others who were, I think, more gung-ho. Um, uh, so we have kind of a, a qualified answer on this, saying we should look at it hard. But, uh, I don't know, Varun or Colin, would you wanna add anything to that? Uh, well, David, I, I, I fall into your camp. I, I'm skeptical given the amount of, of energy and political capital it takes to, to reorganize the department. Um, I think there, there might be some small scale reorganizations that, um, that could help the department more effectively do large scale demonstration projects or that could enable greater uh, interagency collaboration. But um, yeah, in general, I, I, I wanna do the minimum necessary. We're down to our last few minutes and I wanna give each of our distinguished speakers a chance if they'd like to just to, to say some, some final words and then let Jason um, close it off. Um, I just want to say thank you to, to everybody who's participated in this. It's really been a great group of co-authors, a, a great team um, uh, that's been working on this. Um, this, um, this video, this session is going to be available online. It'll be posted um, online. And, and uh, let me just turn to um, I'm gonna start with you, John, to see if you have any final thoughts. And I'll turn to Kathy and, and it will just go quickly down the screen uh, that I'm seeing. Um, ending up with Jason. My, uh, my summary is that uh, great brains, great money, and great track record applied to an extraordinary existential challenge will solve it. We will solve this, but we have to be consistent and determined. And I very much hope, I very, very much hope that, that what people see around them, uh, and as Kathy and I talked about, and their health as well, says to them, this is a very important thing and it requires my attention and my support. I'd love to see that happen and I'd love to see it happen in America, of course, but also in Europe, in India, in China, to name but four places. Thank you. Representative Castor. Well, thanks, uh, Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. This Energizing America report comes at a critical time. I love that it is in sync with our Solving the Climate Crisis roadmap as well. So gosh, we have all these roadmaps. Let's just uh, start down the road and, and get there. But we, we're completely in sync with you about the need to raise public investments in clean energy innovation and that uh, we need to broaden our national energy innovation mission uh, making sure our research universities, nat national labs, entrepreneurs uh, benefit from a tripling of the energy R&D uh, budgets and focus on deployment 
Uh, this is our, this, we have to act with urgency, but this is also an enormous opportunity to create good paying jobs across the country and help solve the climate crisis across the globe. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for all your leadership on this. Uh, Varun. Great. I just want to say a note of thanks. This was a real team effort. You know, you see all three co-authors here, but we're really missing Dr. Julio Friedman, Dr. David Hart, two tremendous co-authors. Dr. Sherwood Randall actually deeply influenced this, this uh, publication, and we thank her for uh, her feedback and guidance. Jason conceived the project, and the whole team at Columbia, uh, I'm talking about Lori, Caitlin, Artelia, Jesse, and many more, were so instrumental. And thank you, Chair Castor and Lord Brown, for joining us today. We're really thrilled to have you. Liz. I'm going to briefly go back to that last question about reorganization, having both at the White House and in the Energy Department. What I believe we need to have is visionary leadership at the top that, that drives progress in the federal government and across our nation and throughout the world. We can't do it unless we have that leadership in place. And the government needs to work like a, a well-conducted orchestra. And we need to inspire our states and our cities to come along and our private sector to work in collaboration with us and the world to join us again. That will make this possible, as Lord Brown said. Thank you to each of you. What a delight it has been to participate in this conversation. I look forward to going out and doing everything I can to create the context within which the goals you have set forward in Energizing America can be implemented. Thank you, and thank you again for your remarks today. So, so thoughtful and interesting. Colin. Um, yeah, so I've been busily scrolling through the questions and I've tried to answer all of the questions as they've come up, but I, I have not gotten to everyone. So first, just I, I apologize and feel free to email me if, uh, email me your question and I'll respond. Um, but I'll just by saying that we, uh, you know, the United States has launched these national innovation missions on the scale that we're recommending previously for the Apollo mission, um, for the Manhattan Project, and it's time to do that for climate change. Uh, we've shown we can do it before. We we need to do it for climate change now. Tom, um, thank you, and thank you for your great work, uh, Varun. Thank you for your great leadership and and being lead author on this report. A program note, the Center of Global Energy Policy has two more Climate Week events uh, tomorrow. Uh, one is at 9 a.m. and it's on environmental justice. The second is at noon and it's on food and climate change. Um, and with that, Jason, I'll turn it over to you for the last word. Thanks. Well, I just want to say thanks to such a distinguished group of uh, speakers for joining us and congrats again on such an excellent report. And just um, echo what Chair Castor said. Uh, we're out of time and the carbon budget is finite and you've had decades of inaction. And unlike local pollution, you sort of pollute the river for a while. When you stop, eventually it kind of can clean itself up with some remediation. That's a lot harder to do for climate. And so we need urgent action. And the 2020s needs to be the climate decade. That, that I think there's broad agreement on this, on this Zoom about that, um, maybe not as much in our political discourse as there should be. But I do want to emphasize what's come across, I think, in this conversation too, which is really regardless of your views on that question and climate change. Um, this, there's no doubt that clean energy technologies are going to be a rapidly growing part of the energy mix and a huge economic opportunity. And we see what other countries around the world, China and others are doing to lead in that area. And so I really hope there can be broad bipartisan consensus that investing in energy innovation and making sure America can lead in that regard uh, is something that we should do uh, as a nation and is gonna be in the country's best interest, both for deployment, but, but also, uh, uh, I'll give another shout out to Varun because he talked about the need for R&D and innovation as well as deployment. And one good example of that is the book over his shoulder right now, which is uh, Taming the Sun and, and, and a good example of what that looks like in one technology, which is solar, where we not only need deployment, but we need more innovation as well. And that's true across the board. I'll also echo what, um, what Liz said about the need to develop a pipeline of talent more people like Varun and everyone else on this call. Uh, and, and we're, of course, doing our part with that here at Columbia University, where in addition to all the work we're doing at the Center on Global Energy Policy, Columbia is announced it's building the first climate school in the country, the first new school at Columbia in 25 years. And we have an event as part of Climate Week later today with some of our colleagues there to talk about the wildfires and with climate scientists who are studying the role of climate change 
in, uh, in, 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 in tragedies like that. Uh, so it's been a tremendous week. Uh, we have, as you heard, two, two more events tomorrow as a formal partner for Climate Week NYC. Thanks to you all for uh, joining us. And uh, we hope you'll join later this evening and also join us tomorrow. Again, the full video of all these events will be available on our website. Uh, today's webinar, just one of a series of events we're doing this week. And if you missed any of them, you can find them online. Uh, thank you all again for your hard work on this report. Thank you, Chair Castor and Lord Brown and uh, Liz for joining us today. Thanks to all of you for tuning in. Enjoy the rest of your day.